of children ages 5 to 11 will soon be eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. We'll explain the plan to roll out the vaccine to this young group. And later, how local and state leaders are planning to distribute the millions of dollars from a settlement with opioid producers. And former Arizona Congresswoman Gabby Giffords is leading a nationwide tour to raise awareness for gun violence. The new memorial honoring those killed from gun violence in California. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Julia Sandor. And I'm Cara Marroquin. Thank you for joining us. Today, the Biden administration announced a plan to vaccinate millions of children ages 5 to 11 across the United States. If the Pfizer vaccine receives wider FDA authorization, the White House is hoping for quick distribution. Officials say they have 15 million doses set to ship nationwide and will have more in the upcoming weeks. The administration is working to set up clinics in over 100 children's hospitals, doctor's offices, pharmacies, and possibly schools. This is different from the original COVID-19 vaccine rollout, where mass vaccination centers were open throughout the country. Even if the vaccine for children gets FDA approval, experts believe adults will be hesitant to give them the shot. With our kids, without having a vaccine for them, we've left them vulnerable to the circulating virus. And it's really important that families learn about the benefits of this vaccine and make a decision by talking to their pediatrician or their healthcare provider. Even though children have a lower death rate from the virus, they can still face illness and long-term issues, all which are still being studied. If authorized, about 28 million more children in the U.S. will be eligible to receive the vaccine. The FDA's panel of outside advisors and advisors from the CDC will weigh in on the application within the next two weeks. Tucson City Council announced that any city employee that is not fully vaccinated against COVID-19 by December 1st will be terminated. Tucson City Council voted on Tuesday for the vaccine requirement. The motion passed 4-3. to three. This comes after the city's policy that went into effect in August, requiring all city employees submit proof that they have received at least one vaccine or be subject to a five-day unpaid suspension. City employees who remain unvaccinated after the deadline will be served with an intent to terminate, and the final decision will be made no later than December 17th. Arizona communities harmed by the opioid epidemic may soon have some relief. At a press conference today, county leaders talked about how they will distribute millions of dollars from a settlement with opioid producers. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Quinlan was at the press conference and has more. The settlement agreement is set to bring in roughly $550 million for prevention, treatment, and services for those directly affected by the epidemic. At the press conference, we heard from lawyers who worked on the agreement, families impacted by the opioid epidemic, and Maricopa County attorney Alistair Adele, who recently revealed she was in treatment for addiction issues. The money from the agreement will be divided with 44% going to the state and 56% to local governments. After lawyers and other expenses have been paid, there will be millions available to help those struggling with addiction. The settlement money is going to impact non, both nonprofits that are working in this space to get services to those that are directly impacted, whether they're in active addiction, whether they're in recovery, um, but we can also use some of this money to provide resources for you know, housing, job training, things like that. How much each area of the state gets depends on the number of factors, including the amount of opioids coming into the region, the amount of deaths due to drugs, and the number of people suffering from opioid addiction. Maricopa County is expected to receive $80 million from the settlement. In the newsroom, Lauren Quinlan, Cronkite News. There are more than 100 gun deaths per day in the United States. Former Congresswoman and gun violence survivor Gabby Giffords went to L.A. to unveil an installation with her organization. Our Los Angeles Bureau reporter Jude Binkley visited the memorial for more. As part of a nationwide tour to raise awareness for gun violence, former Arizona Congresswoman Gabby Giffords unveiled the L.A. Gun Violence Memorial in Exposition Park yesterday. The memorial features 3,400 white vases with flowers representing each Californian who died from gun violence in 2020. Stopping gun violence takes courage. 
the courage to do what's right, the courage of new ideas. I've seen great courage when my life was on the line. Now is the time to come together, be responsible. Democrats, Republicans, everyone. We must never stop fighting. Fight, fight, fight. Be bold. Be courageous. The Giffords organization unveiled a memorial at National Mall in Washington, D.C. earlier this year, which had 40,000 vases to represent the national total of gun violence deaths. We, we've heard a lot of praise for former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords for her courage, her resilience, her determination. She's one who has committed, had to commit her life to her recovery. In January 2011, a man shot and killed six people and injured 13 others during an attack on Giffords in Tucson. She was among several gun violence survivors who spoke at the event, as well as California State Assemblymen. What you see behind us is a monument to thousands of people whose lives were destroyed. Thousands of families who have been impacted. The memorial sits in Exposition Park near the USC campus in South Los Angeles until Friday. In Los Angeles, Jude Binkley, Cronkite News. The city of Phoenix has spent the past year testing a sealant on roads to lower temperatures in neighborhoods. The next phase they revealed for the so-called cool pavement next. And later, how Arizona theater companies are bringing diverse productions to the stage. The Mesa City Council approved it. Every day I wake up, my first thought is, how can I serve this community? The biggest hurdle was not taking PTSD personally. Would you welcome, please, the amazing. Everybody that watches this, they say that I am the greatest that they've ever seen. I was so excited when I learned that I was going to be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Ifill, and what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving of whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons, your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. The Mesa City Council approved an all-electric pumper truck for the Mesa Fire and Medical Department. The new truck will be good for the environment and have the newest technology. It will also have less noise pollution and no carbon emissions. With a single charge, the truck should be able to run for four hours or about 10 back-to-back -back medical calls. The vehicle costs about $1.4 million and is being funded by the 2018 Public Safety Bonds and the General Fund. Despite cooler weather as we enter into the fall, temperatures outside are still very hot, especially in areas where there are fewer trees and grass. Reporter Isabella Fredrickson shares what the city of Phoenix is doing to cool down these areas, and it starts with the roads. Over the summer, the city of Phoenix had piloted different formulas to see how they could help cool down our roads. Today, the city is moving into phase two of their cool pavement pilot program. We did nine projects throughout the city, and now we want to take that pilot label off 
go citywide and continue to invest in additional projects. We've tried parking lots, neighborhoods, and um, more dense city streets. We've gotten good results in all of them. We're going to look at different coatings of different colors to see what lasts the longest and produces the best results. The coating will go over asphalt, which while durable, holds in the heat. Asphalt is a very uh, absorbent material and over the course of the day, it doesn't, the heat is absorbed into that asphalt and at night when you're trying to get the break from the heat of the day is when you know most people are trying to escape the heat. That asphalt is slowly evaporating heat and so when it's supposed to be cool at night, all the heat from that asphalt that has been stored throughout the day is now radiating out. So far, with all of the testing and teamwork between the City of Phoenix, ASU, and Guard Top Sustainability, results have been good, prompting this next step. Our residents told us they want us to look for solutions that make Phoenix more comfortable, particularly in the summer. We think cool pavement could do just that. 10 degrees cooling is a big deal. The streets department is also very interested because the streets are getting to be a lower temperature and that may mean that they will last longer. So not only could it make our neighborhoods more comfortable, but fewer potholes. It was exciting to see that not only are we getting temperature differences on the top of the asphalt, but the full depth of the asphalt is cooler. In Phoenix, Isabella Fredrickson, Cronkite News. During the next phase, researchers will analyze two new asphalt coverings to see if temperatures can be reduced even more and see how durable the coating really is. The valley heat continues to keep the fall weather at bay with the temperature staying high. Milan Andrade is in the Weather Center with more. Happy Wednesday, everyone. As we go over that work, we come into the better half of the week. Going into the highs for tomorrow, 90 in the Phoenix area. And as we go up north, we'll notice mid to high 60s as well. But as we go into the lows for tomorrow, we'll notice up north gets pretty chilly. 32 in Flagstaff, 31 in Grand Canyon, and 31 in Window Rock. Anything below 32 is technically considered freezing. So if you're up north, make sure to bundle up. But down south for the rest of the state, looks like normal temperatures for around this time of fall in Arizona. As we go into the evening planner for tonight, 81 at 6 p.m., great weather, and as the sun continues to go down, 71 by 10 p.m. Any time to go get some fresh air tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a great time to go outside. Going into the eight-day forecast, we'll notice that tomorrow and Friday are almost identical in the state highs and lows. The only difference is Friday has some clouds as well as Saturday, but as we roll into the rest of the week and next, those clouds will clear up and we're looking at 80s and even 79 next Tuesday, but as the lows, low 60s and high 50s for the rest of the week. In the Cronkite News Weather Center, I'm Milan Andrade. I'm Morgan Carden. Coming up after the break, I'll have your Cronkite Sports Report. Wiffle ball tournaments are popping up all over the valley. How one backyard game made it to a major league stadium. Every day I wake up, my first thought is how can I serve this community? The biggest hurdle was not taking PTSD personally. Would you welcome, please, the amazing. Everybody that watches this, they say that I am the greatest that they've ever seen. I was so excited when I learned that I was going to be the next moderator of Washington Week. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by Gwen Eiffel. And what that gave to me was this confidence that I could be my full self and that I was deserving of whatever spaces I was in. Welcome to Washington Week. I also feel this great joy in taking the helm of Washington Week, knowing that I can mold it and make it my own, but also make sure that it is still within the legacy and the tradition that made it so great for all of these years. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app. It's prime time on your time. Watch Prime Afternoons every weekday on Arizona PBS. 
Did you miss a show in the evening? Then catch up on Prime Afternoons, your favorite dramas. No more bloody heroics. Antiques Roadshow. Really? <laughs> Nature and Nova. It's time to reintroduce some wonder into this miracle of nature. All of the best from PBS on Prime Afternoons. Weekdays starting at 1.30, only on Arizona PBS. Welcome back. I'm Morgan Carden, and here is your Cronkite Sports Report. Basketball season is back, and it tips off in the Valley tonight. While the team has been preparing for the game, DeAndre Ayton's contract situation has been front and center leading up to the new year. We send it over to Cronkite News reporter Jaden Sermani outside Footprint Center for more on DA. The Suns fell short in their quest for an NBA championship this past summer, but the road to the finals starts today. The main core is back, including DeAndre Ayton, who was unable to come to terms on a contract extension with the team. Chris Paul says the former number one overall pick is still going to show up and compete. My biggest advice for him is uh, control what you can control, and that's how you go out and hoop. You know, things happen. It's the business of the game, but I know DA's heart. I know how he competes, and I know how competitive he is. And at the end of the day, he wants to do uh, his job for our team. You know what I mean? And I appreciate him for that. And, uh, I know when he step out on the court tonight, it's going to be all about what he got to do to help our team win. Aiden is set to become a restricted free agent at the end of the season. Meanwhile, both Mikhail Bridges and Landry Shamit were extended for four years each. It will be interesting to see if the business side of things affects the team's chemistry this season. At the Footprint Center, Jaden Sormani, Cronkite News. Even without the new contract, DA is set to start tonight and match up against the reigning MVP, Nikola Jokic. First tip is tonight at 7 as the Suns take on the Nuggets in a playoff rematch. The NFL showed some love to the Cardinals this weekend. Kicker Matt Prater was named the NFC Special Teams Player of the Week after his performance against the Browns. Prater's big game helped him eclipse 1,500 points all time. He's only the 24th player in history to surpass that milestone. He has received the Special Teams Player of the Week award 13 times in his career, but this is his first as a Cardinal. He joins Kyler Murray, Chandler Jones, and Byron Murphy as Cardinals, who have won the weekly award this season. Wiffle ball is stealing the spotlight here in the Valley. It turns out that the childhood game isn't just for kids anymore. Competitive leagues are popping up all around the country, and adults are trying to get in on the action. Cronkite News reporter Zachary Larson shows us how one Valley team's backyard league led to a starting tournament at a major league stadium. Strike one, strike two, and you're out. Those are the rules in wiffle ball as it's become a new favorite sport for people like Logan Rose. In 2020, he created a league with his friends and it has since expanded to a tournament at Scottsdale Stadium. During COVID, uh, we started, we were bored, so we started a wiffle ball league in our backyard. That we decided to use that platform and create a tournament here. In the event's second year, the Western Wiffle Ball Classic features four inning games with over 20 different teams made up of three to five players. This elimination style tournament also gives kids a chance to have fun. This kind of just gives these boys an opportunity to just kind of like be kids again. This this means more to them than anything else. It's bragging rights. It's, you know, like they have this circled on the calendar. It's not just for kids either. Adults find themselves competing at a high level. For two-time Wiffle Ball National Champion Jim Ballion, who beat his son to win the Wiffle Ball Classic, Playing in this event is all about the atmosphere. You like that family aspect and you make a lot of friendships and even if you don't win it, it's still a great time. Some of the best local wiffle ball players participate in this event, hoping that their competition will whiff at the plate. Once you start getting down to your elimination rounds, it's going to be, you're going to have your top notch pitchers. These games go even, we saw 12 innings today, and it's just whoever gets that big hit. <laughs> Logan hopes as the competition and the number of teams rise, that the event will become one of the biggest wiffle ball tournaments in the country. In Scottsdale, Zachary Larson, Cronkite News. The USO playoffs are right around the corner, and the Phoenix Rising already have their spot clinched. However, last Saturday's game highlighted another special occasion for the team. 
In the rising 6-3 win over Las Vegas, Niall Dunn made his debut with the squad at just 16 years old. He is the first player to graduate from the Rising's Youth Academy. Phoenix head coach Rick Shantz doesn't expect Dunn to play much down the stretch, but was glad to get him some minutes. We knew that it was going to be difficult for Niall and Lalo, um, but I think Niall's that's a great, a great experience to play on the road, to play in that environment, um, you know, and, and now he just has to keep pushing and keep pushing. And, you know, hopefully, in, you know, maybe preseason next year, he's, he's competing for a starting spot. The NCAA basketball preseason, preseason polls were just released and only one team from Arizona made either the men's or women's top 25. After losing in the national championship last season, the University of Arizona's women's team comes in at 22nd in the nation. Five schools from the Pac-12 made the women's top 25, including Stanford at number three. On the men's side, not as much love for the conference. Although the Wildcats received votes, the team is still on the outside looking in. Meanwhile, UCLA comes in at number two, with Oregon as the only other ranked Pac-12 team. And that is going to do it for today's Cronkite Sports Report. Back to you, Karen and Julia. Coming up, we talk to local theater groups about how they are diversifying their casting choices and theatrical productions. Stay tuned after the break to find out how the big stage will reflect more cultures and communities. Take a journey with Arizona PBS. Join us every Sunday afternoon for Destination Drama. Watch all your favorite PBS dramas like Grand Chester. I'm William Davenport, new vicar of Grandchester. Paul Dark. Nothing in my life has meaning without you. And Victoria. I know that I'm young, but I know my duty. And if you missed a recent primetime drama, we'll help you catch up on those too. Destination Drama, every Sunday afternoon at 1, only on Arizona PBS. Here we go, lights up. Whoa. As artists, we conduct our educations in public. You can never know whether it's going to be a success. One just has to risk it. It's you and the work and the place. It's a very particular relationship. Here's our lens. Tell us what you think. Friday night at 9 on Arizona PBS. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps. Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. Cronkite News is more than your local news station. Through our innovative ideas, we create new ways to connect with our viewers and have their stories be heard. Our cutting edge technology allows us to take a deeper dive into seeking the truth and delivering new perspectives. Stay up to date on top Arizona stories anytime on TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook at Cronkite News. Theater companies in Phoenix and across the country are taking the stage to create productions that reflect the cultures and diversity of the United States. Cronkite News reporter Molly Hudson spoke with a number of local theater groups about making traditional shows more reflective of today. There's good like diversity in Phoenix and when a show utilizes that, it works really well. Julian Mendoza is a Mexican-American who is part of the cast of Camelot. Of the eight-member cast, half are people of color. The three leads in the show are white and like the rest of the ensemble are people of color. So you really get to see that like Camelot is run by the townspeople, by like the people of color who live there. Camelot is not the only diverse production recently seen in Arizona. The cast of Hamilton hit the stage at Gamage just last month, spreading its message at Arizona State University. Particularly at Arizona State University, in light of our charter, it says we will be valued and judged by those we include, not those we exclude, and the success of those, what a more perfect, perfect musical. 
Jennings Rogan Sox sits on the board for the Broadway League, which oversees and supports Broadway theater productions. The Broadway League released a statement on equity and inclusion that emphasizes that they recognize the industry must change to reflect these values. For me, it is important that we continue to show these perspectives and these stories. Chanel Bragg of the Arizona Theater Company says that after the police shootings and social justice protests last year, it's important the actions of theater companies today aren't temporary. I want to make sure that this work, though, isn't just something that is happening as a result of the last year, and that's not going to continue. I think what I want to know is that theaters have a true investment in this work for the long term. She says theater has a greater responsibility to give audiences an opportunity to empathize and connect to the story, something Julian Mendoza is proud to be a part of in Camelot. But maybe one day someone in the audience is like who's any, any race or whatever, but if they're Mexican-American, they're looking up and they're like, wow, that guy looks like me. Maybe I could do that one day. And that it really just touches my heart because I hope, really hope that can actually happen. In Phoenix, Molly Hudson, Cronkite News. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.